name is Mark Edwards, and I'm Professor of Harpsichord here at Oberlin Conservatory. In this video today, you'll hear from me, as well as my colleagues in historical performance here at Oberlin. Together, we form the Oberlin Baroque Ensemble, and we play together from time to time uh, on our various instruments. In this video, you'll hear us talk about our particular instruments that we play, harpsichord, gamba, baroque cello, um, the baroque flute and recorder, as well as the baroque violin. And you'll also hear us talk about some aspects of performance practice. Questions about what does this notation mean? What might the composer have imagined this music could have sounded like? And what techniques can we use when playing historical instruments to make this music come alive? that I play is called the harpsichord. Um, in fact, it's the instrument I'm sitting next to right now. Looks a little bit like a piano, of course, but actually it's very, very different. A big part of what makes the harpsichord different from the piano is how it's built, its mechanism, and how it makes it sound. One thing harpsichordists do frequently that pianists don't is take their instruments apart. So, the harpsichord, in distinction from the piano, is an instrument in which the strings are plucked. If you think about the piano, it has a collection of hammers. When you press on a key, hammer comes and strikes, uh, strikes the string, making sound. On the harpsichord, however, what we have are these strips of plastic. In this instrument, they're made of plastic, but historically they were made of, of wood, hardwood like pear wood. And these strips of plastic or wood are called jacks. You can see in this photograph a little bit more closely how the jack is constructed, the parts it's made out of. We have um, this red felt damper which stops the strings from sounding when you release the key. We also have this spindly little bit of plastic sticking out of the jack horizontally called a plectrum or quill. And this is what actually plucks the string to make it sound. So for each of the keys on the keyboard, I have one or more jacks which sit in registers. And when I press on one of the keys, it's a very, very simple kind of lever mechanism press on one end of the lever, and then on the other end of the lever, the jack pops up, and the quill plucks the string. Sort of up and down motion. Because of how the harpsichord is constructed, there are some very big sort of musical differences between the harpsichord and a slightly more familiar instrument like the piano. If you recall, Actually, the official uh, sort of full name for the piano is the pianoforte, or forte piano sometimes, as it's uh, sometimes known, meaning that it's capable both of piano, soft, and forte, loud playing. At the harpsichord, our ability to play forte and piano is um, somewhat less, shall we say. Depending on how I strike a key, hard, or soft, there's very, very little difference between those two kinds of attack. When we study the harpsichord, we learn how to play with all of the shades of gray in between those two sounds, but on the whole, there's not much difference to be made. So what can we do playing the harpsichord? Well, instead, we can deal with issues of articulation. We learn how to play legato when we play the piano, and in fact when we play most modern instruments we learn legato as our sort of foundational style of playing. And while legato is lovely, it's also somewhat limiting. 
We also learn how to play staccato. But when we play the harpsichord, again, we want to explore all the shades of gray in between those two things, legato and staccato. And so what we discover is that there's a trick that happens that if we make a space before a note, if we create more articulation before it, that note sounds louder to us. Compare these two versions of the same phrase, one with no articulation and one with articulation, and see in which one the C, the top note of the phrase, sounds louder to you. Hopefully we all hear that the second phrase has a C that sounds louder than the first. And so this is kind of a trick that harpsichordists learn to use all the time to create shades of loud and soft in their playing. The harpsichord has a fairly long history as instruments go. We don't know exactly when the instrument was first invented. It was sometime during the Middle Ages, but there's no precise date. It became extremely popular during the Renaissance, and then certainly by the Baroque sort of uh, roughly 1600 to 1750, it experienced its heyday when it was very much the instrument most in demand for all kinds of musical situations. Um, playing solo music, accompanying instruments, accompanying singers, pretty much every situation you need to play music in might have a harpsichord in it. So because the harpsichord enjoyed such popularity for such a long time, it has an extremely diverse and varied repertoire, ranging from the so-called virginalists from Elizabethan England to the wild and extravagant harmonies of the early 17th century Italian keyboard toccata to the um, highly refined yet sensual dance music of late 17th century France to the highly wrought and well-known counterpoint of composers like J.S. Bach in Germany. And beyond, of course, because, as we know, the harpsichord was also enjoyed by composers like Haydn, Mozart, and even Beethoven. So, for pianists amongst you who are interested in learning something about how, for example, a prelude and fugue by J.S. Bach from the Well-Tempered Clavier might have sounded in the 18th century, getting some exposure to the harpsichord is absolutely critical because you, you get to enter somewhat into Bach's own sound world. You get to ask yourself questions about what techniques might Bach have expected here in this music on such an instrument. I should mention that at Oberlin, we are extraordinarily lucky to have an extremely diverse collection of instruments that actually allows us to explore all of these different repertoires in their appropriate setting. So, amongst the dozens of harpsichords we have, we have Flemish virginals from the late Renaissance, we have 17th century French harpsichords, 18th century French, German harpsichords, 17th century and 18th century Italian harpsichords. We essentially have harpsichords of all description to suit any period. And so if you study harpsichord here at Oberlin, you also get to explore repertoire in the most appropriate setting possible. Of course, you can major in any of these instruments, in harpsichord, in Baroque flute, in gamba, any of the historical instruments taught by our faculty. But beyond majoring, you can also dive into um, historical performance practice in other ways. For example, you could take secondary lessons in any of these instruments, including the harpsichord. And also for harpsichordists, you might want to consider learning continual playing in a continual class, or perhaps taking a, a course specifically designed to introduce you to historical keyboard instruments like Bach at the Clavier, which I teach, which is designed to give pianists an introduction to the harpsichord, or a class taught by David Brightman, Time Travel for Pianists, 
which allows pianists to discover the repertoire at a variety of historical pianos from various periods. Also, once you get some experience playing historical instruments, you'll also be able to participate in Baroque ensembles, where you'll get to practice playing your historical instrument with others. In the listening assignment that accompanies this video, you'll hear a performance of Bach's Italian Concerto, played on another instrument from the collection. This present instrument I'm standing by right now is one built in 1969 by William Dowd, one of the sort of pioneers of, of uh, modern harpsichord building in America. The instrument you'll hear on the recorded excerpt is built by Keith Hill, another American builder, and modeled after an 18th century French instrument. Pay close attention as you listen to this piece because you'll notice that it takes advantage of a very special facet of the harpsichord, which is that it has two keyboards. Bottom keyboard, which is relatively loud, and a top keyboard, which is somewhat softer. And so this alternation between the loud, robust bottom keyboard and the softer upper keyboard is something Bach takes advantage of in his Italian concerto. McDonald, and I'd like to give you a little introduction to the Baroque violin and tell you about a few of its defining characteristics. First of all, it's misnamed because it actually is the violin that was used through early Beethoven. So the Beethoven Violin Concerto, written in 1806, was in fact played on such a violin. Now, the most important thing for you to remember, you don't need to remember the real particulars, but the most important thing is to know that there is less tension on a Baroque stringed instrument. Um, for various reasons, the angle of the neck, the setting of the bridge, the light uh, sound post and bass bar, but um, primarily, that's what I'd like you to think, that the instrument is under less tension. So it produces a, a very smooth, resonant kind of sound. It's somewhat related to the folk fiddler in that the fiddle is held not in modern position. And as you can see, it has no chin rest and no shoulder rest. And it kind of rests on you and it's farther over on your shoulder now. An important thing about that is the fact that it affects the right arm. Modern violinists play Tchaikovsky Concerto more in a horizontal way. And the way we hold this instrument, the bowing is slightly more vertical, down, up, down, up. And that leads me to a very important point, which is that the inflections in the bow and the rhetorical style were very, uh, reinforced by this kind of bowing. In other words, the down bow is the heavy bow, the up bow is the light bow. Now the bow is much shorter than the modern bow. It has a very 
uh, measly tip in that you don't get much sound from the tip of the bow and the sound naturally fades away. That fits in very well with the idea of down, up, down, up. So the inflection of the bow was very much heavy, light, heavy, light with a taper always at the end of the stroke. This made up for the fact that there was a rather stingy use of vibrato. Um, most brook violinists, as a matter of fact, did not vibrate at all. And if vibrato was used, it was used especially in a, in a particular spot. It was not just uh, covered, it didn't just cover all the notes as most vibratos did today. Uh, the, all the characteristics of the instrument are very similar to what you're going to learn also in viewing the cello. And so uh, this is just a little start. Thank you very much. The viola de gamba was developed probably the end of the 15th century. We're not exactly sure when, but um, it seems to be related most closely to the guitar family. Um, it bears, bears quite a few physical similarities to the guitar. One is that it has a, a beautifully flat back. And if you've ever seen a guitar, it, unlike the violin family, which has a rounded back, the viola de gamba has this flat back. It also has sort of sloping shoulders, which is still um, something that you can see in the double bass um, in modern symphonies, sort of low shoulders. Similar to the guitar, it also has frets up and down the fingerboard. These particular frets are made with gut strings, just old gut strings that I had on hand. Um, and then it also is tuned sort of similarly to a guitar. So it's tuned in fourths fourths along the top, then there's a third in the middle, and then more fourths. Almost all of the viola de gambas have six strings. Uh, this particular instrument has a seventh string because um, sometime in the late Baroque, the French decided they needed more, more range to their instrument, so they added this super low A. Um, but most of the instruments um, in, the, in the family have six strings. The strings are made out of intestines, which is a little gross, but um, they sound great. These particular uh, strings are made out of sheep intestines on my instrument, and then the lowers are wound in silver to make them heavy. And once they're a little bit heavier, they sound deeper and lower. The other aspect to playing the viola de gamba is underhand bowing. Some double bass players still play with underhand bowing, um, so this may seem familiar to you, but it basically means that you're holding the stick underneath with your fingers um, directly on the hair. And this gives you really great control over how you shape notes and um, gives you sensitivity to this sort of, it's like playing with a calligraphy pen. That's how I think of it. So one of the things about holding the bow underhand is that your weight is far more present when you're at the tip of the bow than when you're, when you're at the frog. When you're at the tip of the bow, you have all this weight in your elbow that's like potential energy, and it drags the bow into the string and gives it this heavy sound. But as you pull away, you get a light, airy sound. This sort of strong and weak sound was, um, it, it was very highly prized in the Baroque because it sounded like the instrument was talking or speaking. So instead of um, a romantic aesthetic or a romantic drive to have a phrase be sung from beginning to end in this long, beautiful line, you can create a sort of spoken quality. So I'll play something sort of reminiscent of a rom romantic song line. <laughs> strong and weak sounds. 
As you can probably imagine, since the instrument was developed in the late 15th century, it has quite a long history. And playing this instrument allows you to engage with history over hundreds of years and explore many countries' styles just with one instrument. One of the largest parts of the viola da gamba repertoire is consort music. And that just means um, a bunch of viola da gambas playing together. And consort music was a bit like string quartet music was in the Romantic it, period. It, it was just a, a wonderfully social type of music. So your friends would get together, you'd play concert music. And um, as you can imagine, a lot of composers wrote concert music that was sight readable and very satisfying to play. In fact, I teach a class that is all concert music. And if you want to learn this instrument, even if you don't play a string instrument, it's a great instrument to get to know early music um, and just play with your friends one night a week. The repertoire for the viola da gamba is, as I mentioned, very diverse and at times incredibly virtuosic and that carries all the way up to the very edge of the classical period. Right around the turn of that, um, that musical aesthetic, one of the things that happened was that music started moving out of the living rooms of people's homes and into concert halls. And this instrument just is not loud enough to carry to 2,000 people, and it kind of died out. Unfortunately, it kind of missed that window for the classical and the romantic period. But thankfully, in the 20th century, it was rediscovered, and one of the people that brought it back to life was my predecessor, Katharina Mainz, and she brought a huge collection of instruments to Oberlin Conservatory. And all of these instruments are available to you um, to study as a major or a minor or for fun or in the winter term class that I teach um, total for total beginners. In fact, that's how I started playing the viola da gamba was here at Oberlin in the winter term class. So I hope you'll join me. So what makes a cello Baroque? Well, this particular instrument um, was not built in the 17th century. It was built in the 1950s, and I decided to turn it into a Baroque cello. The first thing and most obvious is that there's no end pin. The end pin was added in the 19th century to kind of give the instrument um, a little bit more support as the cello repertoire became more virtuosic and as cellists were playing higher up on the instrument, they needed a little bit of support. But in the Baroque, the cellists were mostly playing kind of in the lower register of the instrument and um, didn't need that sort of extra power um, of the upper registers. The next thing that um, makes it a Baroque instrument, which is maybe less visible, is that I've taken a bit of the pressure off the top of the instrument. So I've lowered the bridge um, quite a bit so that instead of sort of a high pitch to the tension on the top of the instrument, it's a little bit further down. Although this is not a Baroque cello, if you ever get the chance to see a real Baroque cello from the 17th century, you'll notice that the necks were also less tilted. Um, so they were a little bit more straight up and down. And again, there was just less pressure on the top of the instrument, which makes the sound a bit softer. And um, as I mentioned in the viola da gamba video, the quality of the sound is a bit more spoken instead of sung. The instrument is also strung with gut strings, which also lowers the, the tension on the instrument. Another aspect of playing the Baroque cello is uh, the Baroque bow. And um, you'll notice in this particular bow, if you've seen a modern bow before, that instead of being concave, it's a convex bow, which means that it's kind of rounded out this way. What this allows me to do is have a lot of weight at the frog with a natural taper in the sound out to the tip. And then I have a, a pretty light up bow as well. Strong, weak, strong, weak. If you study um, historical cello here, you might also come in across a classical bow or a transitional bow, which has a slight taper in the stick, which allows a little bit more uh, weight to travel to the tip of the bow. Which you might want if you're playing classical period music. 
Um, I came here as a modern cellist and have come to the historical cello sort of um, in a roundabout, circuitous way through the viola da gamba. But one of the things that I love about it is I get to discover, rediscover music that I've played for many, many years on modern cello, um, such as the Bach cello suites and Gabrielli sonatas and Baccarini concerto, and kind of uncover how these tools and this instrument uh, create a bit of a um, new interpretation for me of this music that I've known for so long. Hello, I'm Michael Lynn. I'm the professor of historical flutes and recorder here at Oberlin Conservatory. Uh, I teach both types of flutes that we encounter in the Baroque period, that being the recorder family and the transverse flute family. These uh, families of instruments existed alongside from actually medieval times into the Renaissance, early Baroque, and the recorder, of course, died out, sort of like the gamba, as <clears throat> not being a great instrument for a big concert hall and being just more limited in its dynamic possibilities. Um, the recorder, though, is a, an extremely beautiful instrument. It has uh, kind of a, a simple, beautiful quality to the sound. Um, because the, the sound is made directly into the recorder, the air goes directly in without an embouchure. Um, there's a, kind of a clearer sort of articulation that you get with the instrument, so it has a clarity to it that you don't hear in a lot of other wind instruments. Uh, and like the viola da gamba family, the recorder existed in many, many different sizes, uh, even more extreme than the gambas. They could be tiny and they could be eight feet tall. Um, but the most important size in the Baroque period was the alto recorder. Uh, this is an instrument in F, so the bottom note is in F. Uh, you may notice in hearing our playing um, that it, it sounds confusing as to what pitch we're playing at, and that's because we play at a pitch a half step below modern pitch. We play at what we would call A equals 415 instead of A440. This is sort of a modern uh, pitch made out of convenience for a way to play Baroque music, which was played at lower pitches. The thing is that in the 18th century, if you were in one town, the pitch would be one thing. If you went to another town, the pitch would be something different. So this idea of 415 is kind of a convenience because it's an equal-tempered half-step below 440, and that is handy for harpsichords because you can have the harpsichord set at 440 or shift the keys over uh, a half a step, and you can be playing at 415. So at our program here at, at Oberlin, we usually use 415 as our Baroque pitch. Um, the, the other family, the transverse flute family, is, is particularly interesting, I think, because if you look at this instrument, which is the predecessor to the modern flute, you can see that it is a totally 100% different instrument. Whereas if you look at a Baroque cello and a modern cello, they're the same instrument that just went through modifications and kind of an evolution in the sound and the, the acoustical properties of the instrument. But the flute is a totally different instrument. So in the Renaissance, we had a uh, just a cylindrical flute with no key. In the Baroque period, we had a flute like this, which can be made of either three or four parts. This has a head joint, left hand, right hand, and foot. But sometimes this, uh, especially early in the Baroque, this was all one piece. 
Um, and of course, these could be at lots of different pitches. Um, the important characteristic of the Baroque flute that's very different from the modern flute is that each note has a slightly different tone quality to it or a different character to the sound of each note. On, on the modern flute, we work very hard to get a consistency of sound and as, as you play your scales, you want that just to be totally 100% even. On the Baroque flute, it's more that we want each individual note to have uh, the beauty that is within that note. So we're not worrying about playing notes uh, so that they match exactly. And to give you an illustration of that, um, the, the instrument is in D. So if I, if I pick up one finger at a time, and D, high D is a different fingering, but that, that seems like it should be really simple right, to play the Baroque flute, because we just lift up one finger at a time. The problem is that only works if you're playing in D major. So for any note that is not in the D major scale, we have a more complicated fingering. And along with that complicated fingering, we have a complicated acoustics that changes the sound. So here's the difference between an A and a G sharp and a G, for instance. <laughs> If I keep going, so you can hear there's um, a different colors to the notes. Even the the sort of brighter notes have some difference, and the composers use this very beautifully in the music they wrote. Um, we know that this is something they appreciated because when makers started adding keys to the flute to make the notes more even, many flutists thought that was a horrible idea and said, you're ruining the flute by putting keys on it because it no longer has the character of sound. The, the range of this type of flute is basically two octaves and a fifth, and, uh, and it is fully chromatic but using uh, somewhat complicated fingerings along the way. Um, <clears throat> so, as the flute developed, um, this, this was the flute basically up to 1750, 1760, and then gradually they started adding keys to the flute, uh, getting actually quite complicated, and then in 1832, Boehm came out with his first design, 1847 his second design, and that design went on to become the modern flute. But along the way, there are a zillion different kinds of flutes. In the 19th century, it's just extraordinary to see all the different types of mechanisms. And it, it wasn't like when the bone flute came along, everybody decided to play the bone flute. So you can see here uh, some photos of flutes from different periods, starting from the Renaissance and going later into the Romantic period. So here at Oberlin, uh, one can study the recorder, the Baroque flute, uh, and in, in the case of uh, advanced flute players, uh, it's possible to study romantic keyed flute or Renaissance flute. So there are many, many options. Uh, if that's something you're interested in, just uh, send me an email and, uh, and we can talk about what options are available for you. A huge part of learning to play historical instruments, learning to play Baroque music, is learning to deal with new kinds of notation, or in learning to read old styles of notation in a new way. And maybe one of the best examples of this is in continual playing. So as a harpsichordist, this is something that I end up doing all the time. Rather than reading a part that's been entirely written out for me on two staves, space and treble, instead, most of the time, what I'm looking at is a bass line. Sometimes a bass line by itself, but more often a bass line with figures, which you'll all have the joy of learning about in theory class. 
These figures are not there to cause me trouble, but actually to help me in deciding what harmonies to accompany the bass with. But as a player, I end up with lots and lots of freedom with how I will actually realize these figures, how I'll realize the bass line to best support the music that we're trying to create as an ensemble. So, um, just to give you an example, um, you'll hear in the recorded examples a lovely uh, movement by Otter. And I thought first we might hear just a little bit of the bass line as it sounds without any figures whatsoever. Maybe Rebecca would play with me. And so if I add harmony, if I play the figures given to me by the composer over top of this bass line, I end up with something that sounds like this. But I might still want to go a step further. This is not terribly interesting. I'm basically just doing a theory exercise at the keyboard as I play. And what we actually want to do is make music. So I can start playing around with all kinds of sort of window dressing for the accompaniment. I could, for example, add arpeggiation. down any sort of direction. I also have to respond to what my soloist wants to do. So let's say, for example, that Michael has decided he would like to play this prelude fortissimo. Perhaps it's unusual, but he wants to give it a try. So what I can do as a harpsichordist, I can't bang on the keys any louder to make more sound. Instead, I can play more notes in each of my chords. I can play full realization. So there we go, fortissimo. But now Michael has decided that was a horrible idea and it would be better, in fact, to play pianissimo. And so all of the shades of gray between these two dynamics are possible by learning the art of continual playing. So another aspect of Baroque performance that we deal with are two important aspects. One is ornamentation, and the other is the fact that the notation, especially rhythmical notation, is not actually telling us exactly the way we want to play. It tells us more or less how we want to play, but not literally how we want to play. If we have um, four stepwise eighth notes, for instance, especially in French music, but also in English music, sometimes in German music that's in the French style, we would probably play those unequally. So instead of da da di da tam, we would go da da di da tam, slightly rhythmically altering those. And that's not shown to us in the music. That's something we learn from the language um, of the music and studying uh, things like original articulation. There, there are many, many ways that one can learn these things from looking at source material from the 18th century. The auditor example, which we're about to play, is music that has very carefully defined ornamentation written in. Auditor first published this opus right at the beginning of the 18th century, and he wrote um, some ornaments in, but he wrote only plus signs. And basically he was saying, this is the place for you to do the appropriate ornament. Um, about 10 years later, Auditeur published a new edition of these same pieces, and he said in his preface, 
he uh, was wrong. People didn't actually know what was the right ornament to play in those places. And so this time he published the same pieces and he spelled out in great detail what all of the different ornaments are. You can see on the screen a, uh, his little ornament chart. I think there are 13 different ornament signs that he uses and uh, not all of them are done in this particular movement, but quite a few of them are. So to demonstrate um, how this sounds, we're going to play the movement through once without playing any of the ornaments, without making any of the rhythmical alterations that we would normally make. Um, basically what we're trying to do is play it just kind of reading the basic notes and not inflecting it in a, in a Baroque manner and, and not playing the ornaments. Now we'll play this again, and we will do our best to play it in a way that we think reflects what Auditeur had in mind for the piece. All of the pieces that we've played for you today, we've played from uh, original 18th century editions rather than modern editions. So we don't go to the music store and buy these scores and play what a modern editor has told us to play. So part of the, the concept is we want to be looking at the same music that someone in the 18th century looked at. And we want to have to make the same decisions that they made rather than having an editor tell us <clears throat> what those things are. <clears throat> 